Now let's uh, take uh, the f a background uh, for our first topic. Uh, and to, this is to begin our conversation on the 25 years of unbroken democracy in Nigeria. And our background is put together by Joseph Ose. May 29th, 2024, Nigeria recorded a milestone in its democratic journey as it marks 25 years of uninterrupted democracy. This is the longest since independence in 1960. The first republic lasted for six years, the second, four years, while the third republic was aborted as the presidential election was annulled. 1999 ushered in the fourth republic, giving Nigerians 25 years periodic opportunities to elect leaders of their choice and speak to authorities on their desires, aspirations, and monitor development as well as hold leaders accountable. For many analysts, the most appreciable gains of the 25 years is the freedom of expression and speech, far from the authoritarian, oppressive, and lack of accountability experienced during military administrators. Reforms in the electoral process can be counted as major gain. The Electoral Act 2022 became a game changer in the nation's electioneering as it enabled the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, to define the mode of voting and transmission of results as well as to review declaration of election results made under duress. It legalized the use of technology in elections, redefined over voting and mandates INEC to take reasonable steps to provide support to persons with disabilities during voting. The impact has been felt in elections conducted since then, with a lot of outcomes reflecting reasonable participation of electorate and results reflecting the will of the masses. Though the country has experienced some degrees of insecurity and economic challenges within these democratic years, many believe these are temporary difficult moments the country and citizens will go through to reap future democratic games. Guests of Good Morning Nigeria will go down memory lane to be in the light on Nigeria's 25 years of unbroken democracy and the games. All right, that was Joseph Otseng giving us a background, uh, uh, background report, I should say, to our conversation on 25 years of unbroken democracy in Nigeria. And if you've just joined in, uh, this will be our first conversation. A reminder now uh, that we have a second conversation, of course, on the uh, latest in the ongoing organized uh, labor strike and that will come up uh, immediately after this conversation. Let me quickly uh, introduce our guests that are here in the studio. We have of course seated uh, with us is Honorable Samuel Onibu. Uh, he's former member of the House of Representatives and sponsor of Nigeria's Climate Change Act and South East representative on the board of North East Development Commission, NEDC. We're very glad to have you uh, join us today, Honorable Onibu. Thank you very much. Good morning, viewers. All right. First, you have to... Yeah, also joining us here is uh, Senator Binta Masigarba. Uh, she represented Adamawa North Federal Constituency in the Senate in 2015. Apart from that, she uh, also, at a time in her political career, was a, a state party chairman. And then she also has the distinction of representing two different states in the National Assembly. At the time, she was uh, the uh, member representing Kaduna South in the uh, House of Representatives. Uh, let me welcome her, especially Binta Masigaba. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning, viewers. Mm. All right, uh, we're still expecting one or two other uh, people to join us in the conversation as soon as uh, uh, the rival introduce them. But for now, let us begin uh, by laying, you know, a foundation to our conversation so that we can, you know, uh, forge, you know, a pathway. And uh, I'd like to start with Honorable Um how, how did we get here? I mean, it's a local parlance, you know. Mm -hmm. how, how did we get here? Can you just give us a, a kind of perspective on what led to, you know, our democratic journey in 1999? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's been 
a long journey in a sense, and uh, not even a straight journey for that matter, as far as democratic practice is concerned. We started off well, very well. We don't want to go into all the regions and all that. But by the time we had the mishap, the coup, in 1966, January, and then July, and that regime of uh, uh, General Gowan had actually promised to uh, introduce democratic system of government sometime in the 70s, mid-70s. Then there were issues of that not being possible and all that. And eventually, uh, the government of uh, General Motala Mohammed now uh, came and made a promise that they were going to hand over. So General Basanjo, who took over after the assassination of General Mohammed, was able to hand over in 1979. But it was short-lived, just for about three, four years and three months. And by December 31st, you know, 1983, that government was overthrown. And then uh, that was led by uh, General Buhari. And then he too was overthrown by General Babangida. And General Babangida had a long stay, nearly 10 years, and was able to do elections, uh, which produced uh, Chief MK Abiola. Yeah. But then he said the election was annulled, but I'm happy that mm. he's been restored. Um, now, after that, then the crisis, you know, serious crisis came uh, when General Abacha took over, and then General Abacha, you know, passed on. Uh, in 98, and then um, June, and uh, General Abdul Salam took over and then was able to hand over uh, within a short space of time. And then we started from there, and we've been managing to move from there to this you point. Forgot the, one you, point. You forgot the INJ, the, the Shunekon. Okay, the Shunekon <laughs> in, uh, short regime, yeah. yes, which was overthrown by General Abacha on November 17, you know, uh, 1993. Then after that, uh, we saw, you know, by the time um, we handed over, General Absalam handed over to Ch uh, Chief uh, Obasanjo as president. So we have moved from there. It's not been quite smooth. But one thing that we should know, actually, is that we have made steady progress, no matter the challenges we have had along the line. We made steady progress in that under General Obasanjo, there were several Senate presidents that were, you know, impeached. Speakers had issues, were impeached, or just within a short space of time. But after he left, then we saw someone like uh, Senator David Mack having a peaceful stay, you know, staying for two terms even, and just like that. So the point I'm making is that along this line, along this checkered history, we've been able to build some kind of foundation that is worthy of recognition okay. and emulation. All right, talking about foundation and recognition, one would say, you know, some would be looking uh, through the window, outside looking in. You have been part of the process. Um, at a period when people perhaps didn't know that uh, those opportunities would come, you grabbed some of these opportunities. Uh, tell us about your experience as a politician, as and also, you know, uh, in terms of uh, the constituencies that you straddled uh, in the North. Northwest, Kaduna South, you know, not East Adama or North. Uh, tell us about your experiences and some of the things that, uh, are, you know, are unique to this uh, last 25 years. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think to God be the glory that we have this undisrupted or interrupted uh, democracy, 25 years. Uh, it has not been easy. But the most important thing is that some of us took the bold step to buy into that murky water of politics and at that time when we started a lot of people were not given interest in it just because of what he um, the former the, um, the speaker mentioned enumerated how democracy came in and how was it was thwarted and all those things so by 1998 when we started a lot of people weren't sure that it was going to work you know there was no godfatherism at that point in time it is you, the people, and what you have been able to do prior to the time of election. Like me, I, I, I never knew what I was doing. The little things I was doing within that little community was going to pay off 
I never knew. You know, you go to houses where you now how you talk to women, how they can now start trading within themselves, because the Karuna North South that I represented was literally virtually and um, Muslim uh, community where you have most women in the Puda. So now, how do you now see women trying to see how they can start selling things? Then maybe weekends you bring them out to start showing them what uh, sanitation is all about. I never knew that one day it will pay off on that. And when the opportunity came, again, that is another story, working with New Nigeria newspaper, where I was virtually not, uh, should I say, I was, I, because of my gender, there was this discrimination. That was what even pushed me into politics. And I was saying that if as outspoken as I am, I can be treated this way. There are other women who couldn't be bold enough to speak their mind. And we went in. And the thing is that, uh, a woman coming out to vie for politics. There's this elderly man that said, if we have tried the men, they have failed. Why don't you give this little girl the chance to see if she can do it? That was the key. Give her the little chance to see if she can do better. And I held on to that. So the thing is that you go back to I mean, the memory lane to see those that were there before, what have they done or what haven't they done? And I think in 1999, when we came here, we had an interactive section with then the president, um, um, General Olusegun um, Obasanjo. In that, and I said, I asked the question, if I am representing a federal constituency, then that means I must have the face of the federal government in that constituency. So what is the face of the government in my constituency? And through that, when we started, <clears throat> The present Deputy General Secretary General then was the SA on MDGs. And we had to now sit with her and ask her question. Now, how do we now have an impact that the people will see a federal constituency activities within the constituency? And that is when this constituency project came on board. I think I stand and I, I stand to be corrected. In 2001, I think I was the first person to start the constituency project. And what was it? People came out, sought, I mean, see to me winning the election. Then what will I now say thank you at the end of the day? At that time, Kaduna South has 449 polling units, 13 uh, constitu I mean, uh, world, but it is, uh, the, I mean, population is, is condensed and within that area. Mm. And we started with the uh, chairman of those who to now tell them, appreciate them, thank you. And at that time, the government came with this poverty alleviation program called the PAP. And mostly it was just enclaved onto the PDP. And I took it upon myself and I said, no, it is wrong. Election has been conducted. Everybody has won here. On the, in the center, it is PDP. But when you want to go even to the constituency, the 360 members are representing federal constituency, irrespective of their political affiliation. Mm -hmm. May the so, soul of uh, Tony Anene rest in peace, peace. I went and I said, no. So when I spoke in the media, I never knew he, he saw it. And he was looking for this little girl. Unfortunately, then, again, may they so rest in peace. Madaki was the minister of state, being from my state. So I now had to now say, look, Kaduna South, that's why the fight is the APP, I mean, a representative in the federal constituency. Mm -hmm. You should not be, we shouldn't be denied the PAP, that is the poverty mm -hmm. elevation. So, so distinguished senator, uh, the, 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 democr the democratic period, now gave the small girl a platform, yeah. you know, of course, to, to, to realize her, her dreams. Before we even look, you know, deeper in, 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 into what, um, you know, democracy has presented even for the female gender, uh, because that, that is also critical. I, I just like to ask, I, I remember in, in 1976, and I was a very young girl then, I think I was in my primary school, and that was when, um, you know, the coup, you know the uh, um, Dimka, the yes, school, and and I, I, I have a pers I have personal experiences Experience, of schools yeah. because we I, all I, have yes because I, I was within the radio house and mm. it, during the time you would have the armored cars mm -hmm. you know guarding the broad, uh, FRC and we call it broadcasting house in mm. Ikoi at that time all over the place so uh, apart from uh, Dimka school I also 
you know, was privileged to experience Dimka school. So I know what it was, you know, waiting to hear the martial music on radio at about 4 or 5 a.m. And, and, and all that, and then everybody in the radio. So I, I, I'm just wondering, all of these, I know more. How did, how did Nigeria, you know, manage to prevent, you know, that, that uh, uh, scenario? You know, for 25 years, we've been able to hold this democratic, you know, string and hold it tightly. How did we do that? He said it in his um, mm. preambles when he started. Mm. Before the 1966, there was, I mean, a democratic uh, government on ground. What went wrong? And that's the question we should be asking. What went wrong that the, I mean, the military had to take over? And after the military has taken over, what again went wrong with the military that the Nigerians are now clamoring for another democracy. So those are the two angles that we need to look at critically. When we came in before the amalgamations and in the 1959 uh, uh, assembly and what have you in Lagos, I mean all the regional system, what went wrong with the um, democracy that was in place prior to our, to, I mean our independence? Now, what went wrong after? the military took over because probably they were now said the system is not working now they came in on board is the system still working and i think we have to applaud the nigerian nigerians at it were standing to say hey for us to strive we must be the one to lead ourselves and to make pave way for what we will achieve as a people Democracy is for the people, by the people, and of the people. So it's you and I that are the government, and we must put things in order that our people. Now, that is the democracy. Now, who is that person that will come out? They look at the federal, where the president will come in, the state, where the governor will come in, the senatorial district, the federal constituency, the state constituency, the local government, the world. Once if you get those people, and the essence is that uh, vote for the right people that will do the right job, that will bring about the dividends of democracy to the people. Mm -hmm. So the key issue is what is wrong with the military that Nigerians were clamoring for democracy? None that democracy has come to God be the glory 25 years uninterrupted. Some are not happy, but at least we're pushing it. I agree. I agree we're pushing. Uh, I, I, I'm just, just, just before saying, we go to yes, you know, the yes, next and, question, mm. uh, very quickly, let's uh, welcome uh, Professor Emmanuel Remi Ayede. Uh, they say he's uh, online. He's not we'll, ready we'll, yet. We'll go back to him. Uh, <laughs> I'm excited because he's calling from my alma mater, yeah. but we'll, we'll go back there. I know, I know. Okay, because she, she, she's told us that, um, well, what I, I, I can you know, deduce from what Honorable Masi has told oh. us is that Nigerians probably desire democracy and and who would not you know if you understand if, if we know the value that democracy confers but is that really it I mean it's a long it's it's a long period 25 years there must be something that Nigerians you know have benefited from the democratic process that has enabled them to sustain you know uh, this process unbroken for 25 years mm. But perhaps you can bring this on board, just to, to, you know, just to add to it, because I know yes. you are going to go far. Uh, you were part of, you know, uh, the committee mm -hmm. that put together the electoral act. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about, you know, uh, the electoral cycle, mm -hmm. you know, coming every four years, mm -hmm. apart from the off-cycle elections, naturally, mm -hmm. um, this is key to the sustenance of democracy. Mm -hmm. Having, you know, the electoral act that would be you know uh, the conveyor belt so, yes. sort of to help you know the processes along yes in your capacity mm -hmm. as a member of that committee putting that together and in your experience as a nigerian ushered in by fellow nigerians into the green chambers tell us about your experience and the you know distinguishing features you know of these 25 years and the other republics thank you very much indeed um there are many reasons why we, as a people, Nigerians, have now settled for a democratic process. I'll quickly refer to some of the views expressed by James Harrington, one of the very, very, very uh, early authors on, you know, checks, balances, tenure, and uh, all that. 
uh, his views were later expanded by you know Montesquieu on the issue of checks and balances and all that. The, the essence is that you have to have tenure. Tenure is key, and that's why I like to refer to James Arrington quite frequently. Tenure is key. The people know that, okay, he's going to be there for four years. If he does well, we will send him back. Yeah. If he doesn't do well, we'll find a way to remove him. Tenure is key. And that appearance that, well, he has a limited period of eight years, assuming you're a governor, you are a president, and all that. Those things help to, you know, uh, make people have confidence in the process. And again, when you have to go back, and say, please, this is my record, my mm -hmm. service record. Consider me and send me back. You now know that you are drawing your strength, your stay in office from those people who come out in the afternoon, in the, even in the rain, to use the power of their tongues mm -hmm. to elevate you to that position. So if you know you are answerable to them, then you have a duty. I'm not trying to be personal, but I know in my federal constituency, Ikuano, Omaha North, South, when I represented. They used to have one, one time. But when I came, I knew I was sent by the people, and I walked. And up to today, I'm the only person that was re-elected in Africa constituency for 25 years. So when you represent her, you know that you owe your stay to those people. You have to do that. Then on the issue of the Electoral Act, we looked at it over and over, and spotted some areas where there are flaws. Uh, we were particular also about this issue of how you conduct election, primary elections, which should be the foundation of whether you will be accepted by a party and to eliminate imposition. That's why you have section 84, subsection 1 of that act. And so many other things, even looking at the local government system, there was the feeling that, oh, local government belongs to the state and therefore we should not look at the law. That's why we came up with section 150, subsection 3, to make sure that as we go forward, Conducting local government election, which is the foundation of the grassroots, mm. there has to be in compliance with the provisions of the Act. So for us to have done this successfully mm. for 25 years means that the people have seen that in some ways it's a little bit predictable that this is what is going to happen okay. after a period of time. So democracy is predictable. Significantly predictable in terms of performance, in terms of your tenure in office, if you're making trouble, they know that, okay, even if he forced himself on us, after eight years, you're out the door, if you're a governor. So these things help to reinforce, you know, make people say, okay, let's wait for him. And the other one is, as we are progressing, as we are moving forward, beginning to deepen and broaden the basis of our democratic process, election is key. Because that's the only way, the only way that you go to secure another authority, the mandate. Mm -hmm. to represent the people. So it's not a question of somebody watching over his shoulder whether another person is bringing a gun, you know, to play the martial music that you talked about. Mm -hmm. I think we had enough of the martial music. We've had <laughs> we're, we're a great nation, the most populous black nation on earth. So we have a duty to move in the right direction. Our economy, our politics, and even our culture and what we represent. So mm -hmm. these things, when you look at them, and you look at the growth that we have achieved over the years, then you then agree with me that this is where we should be. We have to work and continue to perfect. Mm, I like that. But he, he also asked you to um, share with us some of your experiences. I don't know if it's like you want to quickly paraphrase your question so that no, before I, we bring it. You know, it's, 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 yeah. you know the, um, working on the Electoral Act was one of you know its, its interventions. Of course, uh, you mentioned climate change as well. Mm. But just as an ordinary Nigerian, mm. you know, and the process, you yes. know, going to your constituency in Kwano oh. and uh, Umaya, North and South, you know, speaking to the people, getting a buy-in to some of those things you were talking about. Uh -huh. From that point to now, have we matured in terms of, exp you know, experience and the process? Uh, because uh, I'm talking from, you know, covering some of these bits, uh, going to some of these elections. It seems to me as if uh, not much has changed in terms of the interaction. In, in, instead of looking at the, you know, manifestos, uh, people still look at the bag you are carrying. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, that is there. But I'll tell you something. It's work in progress. We have made great progress. It's work in progress indeed. And I just cited an instance. I, I don't want to be particular. But look, my federal constituency, people went for one time, one time. I went and I said I wanted to go back. 
it, there was resistance from the leaders, but the ordinary people who have seen my work ensured that, one, I was re, you know, re-elected during the primary election, which was where the conspiracy is always found. And then in the general election, the people voted massively. So we have made progress, like I said. It's work in progress, no doubt. But we also would like to advise our friends, our colleagues who are in politics. That's not all about we are in either traditional and then maybe a barriga and all that. Work for the people, make difference. They will see it and they will pay you back. Mm. So all right. Okay, I, I thought uh, Professor uh, Ayede is is there. Uh, Professor Emmanuel Remy Ayede, uh, Professor of Political Institutions, Governance and Public Policy, Department of Political Science, University of Ibadan, and uh, he's joining us via Zoom from Ibadan or your state. Prof, uh, thank you for joining us. I've taken the, the baton away from Fisayo. He wanted to introduce you because you're coming from his constituency. But <laughs> there are no constituency projects. Thank you for joining us. So uh, please, can you weigh in uh, on a discussion? We're trying to find out um, why is it that or what has made Nigerians to sustain democracy for 25 years and being able to prevent you know, us from hearing those marshals and the music from the barrels of the gun. Yeah, thank you, and then good morning, Nigerians. Um, if you follow the series of surveys by Afro Barometer uh, over many years, uh, you know that uh, Nigerians have always preferred democratic rule to uh, military rule. Um, also, if you follow public discourse for decades now, even during the military rule, they always describe military rule as an aberration. So they think that the normal thing to happen is for democracy to prevail. And so uh, after the long period of military rule, no one is really eager uh, to return uh, to that kind of rule after the uh, experience that we have had for over two decades. So uh, we have experienced some challenges with democracy but um, it was not always all the time this challenging. Uh, if you look back to the very early days uh, of the Fourth Republic, which began in 1999, you see that uh, we actually started with greater optimism uh, that, than we currently are experiencing. Uh, the conditions of the workers, the reform of governance, uh, the introduction of monetization, uh, the uh, improvement in the uh, global oil market and the rise in the um, standard of living of Nigerians, I was experienced during that period. So uh, the first uh, eight years was somewhat filled uh, with optimism uh, until the 2007 election, uh, which uh, was so badly conducted that uh, Nigeria began to experience some form of dissolution. But even after that election, if you go on to the um, subsequent election in 2011, not only was were things still looking okay, the economy was not really uh, very bad. Uh, it was not until around uh, 2015, 2016 that the first major recession uh, came in. Uh, although we've had a problem with uh, the conduct of elections, the introduction of uh, technology and the series of reforms that were made uh, under the Jagar government, there is hope that, uh, yes, we are having challenges with um, election, but that this will eventually be resolved. Our uh, introduction of the technology, the uh, card reader, then later on the, uh, uh, the biometrics and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, as it turned out, it seems that uh, the trajectory was not going in a linear manner. And, uh, uh, and suddenly we are faced with uh, serious economic challenges as well as even problems with the conduct of elections, especially with the debacle that happened with the technology glitch in the 2023 election. So while, yes, we are going through very difficult moments right now, at no point in the history of the Fourth Republic were we this down. So I, I think, uh, yes, there's, there's cause for worry, but uh, we can also beat our chest and say we moved up a little bit. Um, if you look at uh, these last 25 years, you know, and look at some of, you know, the question I put uh, to Honorable Nubo earlier, the distinguishing features, some would say, you know, 
uh, some of the republics we've had in the past, there was a lot of, you know, uh, internal party, you know, democracy in terms of, you know, the activities and capturing the imagination of the people with their manifestos. Have we grown from that? Or are we going backwards in terms of, you know, engaging the public, not making it uh, for a four-year festival like the one I have in my village? Yeah, I, I think that um, it's a little bit of both. One is, is to recognize the fact that um, we are operating in a period where uh, there's no sharp ideological divide, even globally. Uh, previously, uh, we normally talk about the leftists and the rightists, uh, and then we talk about uh, the social democrats. And the ideology is define political parties. Uh, in, in advanced countries, um, they have sort of been able to uh, hold some kind of identity for the major parties. Uh, but here in Nigeria, neoliberalism has taken over, and uh, all parties seem to have of neoliberal policies. And that's why, if you look at the build up to the 2023 election, all presidential candidates were, in fact, saying that uh, they will remove subsidies. So their policies uh, hardly diverge in terms of the vision of the political parties in concrete terms and, and uh, in terms of the uh, manifestos of the candidates as well. Uh, but that's not to say that uh, there are still no, no differences uh, claim to to conservative. Uh, but that's, that's how far it goes, uh, programs, because again, they are the, the, the kind of intellectual uh, influence that we have on the Nigerian government, we see heavy presence of organizations like the World Bank and the IMF. And then we also see that the political class seems to have embraced those, those kind of policies. So we are in a situation where uh, ideology is not very significant. And that's why even for this government, we ask, yes, we have this series of policies that we are we bandy around, but what is the grand vision? you know, of the government in the next uh, four years, in the next eight years, or even in the next 20 years. So we, 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 it is to that extent that, uh, uh, yes, there's a loss of uh, that ideological touch that you find within the political parties. And also because you don't have that uh, ideology drawing people to political parties, the political parties have become very fluid. Uh, people move around, uh, go and fro, you know, and again fro and to. Uh, uh, within those political parties. So it, it's difficult to make any claim uh, that uh, we have these strong manifestos that uh, Nigerians uh, rally around. Uh, you don't really see uh, that that kind of uh, uh, feature in the politics of today, uh, contrary to what we had in the Second Republic and the First Republic. Ayede, thank you for the point that you have enunciated. Uh, we'll just uh, keep you on hold for a moment and return to you uh, presently. Uh, back here in, this, in the studio, uh, you know, S Senator uh, Bintamasi, uh, I, I, I want to, you know, take you back to what Honorable Onibu, you know, talked about, the, the, the driving force, the, the factors that enabled us to sustain our democratic you know, process for this now. He said, first of all, that the uh, democracy is predictive, but of course he anchored that on elections, tenure and, and elections. And I, I'm just wondering, in terms of governance and leadership, how predictive you know, has the political leadership been over the past 25 years? Well, I think the dimension is changing. If you look at how we started on the, the fourth assembly, now we're in the tenth assembly. And if you now put it on a scale of preference, the people's wish are becoming more allowable. Okay. Yeah, it's allowable than those political uh, uh, powers that ought to be. Take a good example of two states where instead of the tenor to be two terms, they ended up with one term. My state, Adamawa State, and Lagos State. My state, Adamawa State, I have to take the state where, at least I was the chair when we brought in uh, uh, Bindo, Senator Bindo, mm. into office as a governor. So what went wrong that he wasn't re-elected? 
the people weren't happy with some of his policies. With all the powers that came on board, the people said no. So if it were before, the powers would say yes. And the people would now say yes. But even if you look at the National Assembly, which obviously I am beginning to have problems with the tenor of the National Assembly. If you bring in a member for the first time, no matter how intelligent you are, you must take two to two and a half years to understand the rudiment of legislative activities. Now you bring in a new a starter, and by the time he or she is beginning to understand the rudiment of I mean, parliamentary activities, he's thinking about re-election. And when he, she or he goes back for re-election, the people might not say, no, it is maybe this local government A, you are from local government A, it is the time of local government B. They have forgotten to understand that the more you leave a parliamentarian in the parliament, the better for that constituency. So government, again, on the other hand, spends so much money in trying to put the freshers on board. And the time when government will now say, OK, this is the time for us to now start ripping from what the investment we place on that, the constituents, the constituents are saying, no, we don't want that person. So day in, day out, I can understand where he's coming from. Because if you bring in first member, after four years, the person is out. Another person is coming. Government, if government spends in terms of, uh, uh, how will I put it, in terms of improving the knowledge of that member, <laughs> it's gone. So, so in, what is the context of evolution what we're, that you have seen in the, in the legislature over so the past years? What I would have appreciated yeah. even the, yeah. the electoral act because the Electoral Act is revolving. Mm -hmm. You can't run away from it. I remember when I was a member of the uh, I mean, Constituent Assembly of uh, the National Confab. Uh, one of the things we said in government and governance is that, look, we have won this parliamentary. We said it wasn't working. Mm. We are now in presidential. Now people are now saying that it's too expensive. Now can we now take a di di digression away from the presidential and probably go back with a new form or a new phase. Let's have, we have six zones. Can we now say each of those zones should produce a vice president? So if the entire five zones produces vice president, one of the zones now can now go out nationally to produce, as, I mean, the president. Then give them a five years term, single term no matter whatever you do, and come out with a policy that will encapsulate all the other uh, region to now know if the northern Nigeria is education. Put education only on the northern Nigeria. The southern part, whatever it is, if it is, has to do with uh, uh, agriculture, or, I mean, infrastructure or whatever, so that at least the federal government well, if North, Northwest produces the federal, I mean, the presidency, the other one should have a federal, I mean, a vice president. After five years, Northwest will not produce. This is your proposition. That was what this we is, proposed. Okay. At that the was what we confirm. proposed. But again, people now say, no, it's going to be too expensive. Now, what we are now trying to say is that because the agitation of Nigerians now is that some people are more inclined to govern the the, the country than other people. So once the rotational system is not captured in the constitution, PDP started it, let's have a rotational system. That even in the states, as we are now talking, it is working. Because if northern part of a senatorial district produces a state governor for eight years, other zones will now be saying, no, it is our time, it is our time. So when we replicate it, it will go a long way to now say, okay, now this democracy has come to stay for good. Now, on a daily basis, we've started on this angle, it is not working. Now, okay, let's paraphrase it and go to this angle to see how it's working. So if we do that, Obviously, it will take us to another dimension. Let me come to Honorable Nibu, but the question is for both of you. But for you who drive the system, politicians, 
sometimes you confuse the voters. You come <laughs> four years showing one flag, the next year another logo. Sometimes even at the junction of the hall, they will ask which party are you now? <laughs> so what do we do to that in terms of, you know, driving a system, you know, improving trust and letting us know exactly where you stand? Because when it's so shaky, where you stand, in uh, you know, uh, at different times, it's difficult for those who even want to follow to know where they are. Thank you, uh, Fisayo. Um, your points are well taken. It's very important. And it's one of the things we try to address, you know, when we're working on the Electoral Act. But I'll tell you something. It's got to do with the system. It's got to do with the Nigerian system. And that's why I said in one of the interviews I did in those days that the party administrators and major stakeholders in a state they have serious rules to play to safeguard, ensure that we deepen and broaden our democratic system. The reason I'm saying that is that, from my own personal experience, even when you are doing well, a few party administrators with some stakeholders can get together and say, you know that uh, Binta, she's not going back. It's true. And when you ask them, Oh, is she not is she not working? They will not respond to whether the person is working or not. They'll tell you it's not going back. That's the reason why you find some people quickly start looking for another place to give them a platform to run the election. I've said this before and I'm saying it again. It's up to us, Nigerians, to help to ensure that when you are elevated through the power of the thumbs of the ordinary people, whether as a party administrator or as a legislator, you have a duty to be honest, to do your best to improve the system and not to create you know, problems along the line. And once that is done, you allow people to now choose that, oh, Fisai is doing his job well, let's return him. Then they vote for you. And not that when they come to primary elections, you are already excluded, even before the primary election begin. So that's the reason why you see a lot of people changing flags. The other one is some, lead, some of their leaders, she talked a little bit about godfathers and all that. When they are moving, they want to move with their followers. And you see some of those followers moving to another party because their leader has moved to another party. And um, there was a point she tried to make about, you know, the proposals at the confab and the issue of, you know, rotational and maybe six vice presidents out of which you have one president. I think perhaps one of the challenges with that would perhaps be the issue of whether we're going to have a one-party state or you're going to have proper political contestation where people from different political parties are also aspiring to get to that position. So if you are having proper political contestation, then it's going to be a challenge in having you know, people who are going to just go in particular order. Because one of the beauties, or one of the particular beauties of a democratic dispensation is the fact that you have the chance to choose when you are running a plural democracy. You have the chance to choose from either party A or party B due to their performance. So you probably have this kind of proposal working. When you have, okay, we have a one-party state, it's just going to be like this, and then it gets to the top. So um, these are some of the ways by which we can really make our system work, and work very, very well. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Honorable Oliver. Uh, Professor Ayade, uh, if you're still with us, again, I'm sure you listened to Senator uh, Binta Masi and Honorable Onibu talk about some of the um, gains <laughs> in the past 25 years uh, of the National Assembly and of course uh, what they hope you know can, can change and um, Senator Binta is, talked about you know going probably going back to a parliamentary system of government um, but what we're not certain is whether that is intended as you know, a measure or as a way of reducing cost of governance, which Nigerians have been canvassing, uh, or probably restructure 
you know, um, the, the, the political uh, structure, political and electioneering structure, um, uh, probably we, we, we want to know whether a parliamentary system, uh, rather than having a unicamera, you know, uh, legislature, would, you know, suffice for our democracy. W what are your thoughts on that? No, I think this uh, debate has gained the attention of um, a number of Nigerians, including uh, the Nigerian Political Science Association. Uh, and a, a lot of ideas have come out of that, those debates. One is that uh, we must distinguish between uh, attributes of the presidential system and attributes of governance more broadly. Uh, we sometimes we attribute things that are not cannot uh, that, that, that do not derive from the um, form of government to it so the presidential system of government is not particularly known to be very expensive across the world so if, even when we discuss the, the advantages and disadvantages between presidential and parliamentary system uh, the cost of governance is not a major factor uh, the cost of governance is, is, is very clear where the cost is coming from uh, for instance, if you talk about the number of ministers, uh, you can decide whether or you want to have 46 ministers or if you want to have 50 ministers. It does not change the, the presidential system because you have only four ministers. So I, I think it's important for us uh, to clarify that so that we know precisely where the cost of governance is coming from. Now, if you decide that uh, uh, you want to... Uh, reduce the cost of governance, you may also think about uh, whether you have a single uh, legislature or you have two. If you have one uh, and the population is just as much as you when you have two, uh, uh, and then you're still paying them the kind of uh, uh, salary allowances and you still require the same kind of infrastructure, Issues are uh, associated with the presidential system that people talk about. Uh, the first, of course, is your idea of gridlock between the executive and the legislature. And before saying the kind of checks and balances that is expected as a great situation where that uh, will be addressed. Then the second one is also that, uh, uh, which is not directly related to the, uh, the presidential system, but it's actually related to the electoral system that we run. Uh, and, and people are thinking that uh, we need to create a situation where the political parties will be very decisive in terms of how people behave in parliament. And when you look around uh, for a solution to some of these problems, what you find is that uh, we need to look at the objectives of government, the challenges that we have faced, and think about ways and means of reducing where the cost is coming from. And the, Many people have suggested that we should not just throw away ways of modifying it. In other words, taking from the parliamentary system whatever thing, uh, uh, features we think would help our presidential system work better. And that's why uh, it is not so anything peculiar to Nigeria. If you look around the world, hybrid system, what some people call semi presidential system or semi parliamentary system, have become much more common. Uh, that's why if you look at the situation in South Africa, for instance, uh, they have a semi-parliamentary system uh, where uh, you have the president and you also have a head of government. Uh, the relationship, of course, is not like that. Uh, what Exactly what you have uh, in, in the First Republic uh, Nigerian parliamentary system. So there are many options that can be uh, adopted to modify Nigeria's presidential system and address some of these measures, these uh, uh, challenges. Some people have even suggested, including the uh, political reform conference under uh, Gulio Jonathan, that uh, we should trim down the number of ministers and also find a way of ensuring that ministers are not taken from outside uh, government, but that some of them are taken from parliament, uh, rather than uh, getting ministers from outside government in order to reduce costs and to create a more asset between the legislature and the executive. So there are possibilities of uh, doing that, but must distinguish between what is causing the co cost of government to be high as distinct from uh, uh, with the problems with the presidential system that we need to address.
Thank you, Prof. Let, let's, let's come back to, you know, um, Senator Pinter. And this is an aspect, you know, before we wrap up that I, I want you to talk about. Nigerians vote for the candidates, but parties present them. You are a party state chairman or, you know, of a party. What do you bring on board when you talk about the leadership, you know, recruitment processes? that you know you now present us with these candidates we are left with the options that you present to us as you know parties what goes into those things well maybe because i've been in um, i've been involved in um, elections when i was in kaduna and i saw what transpired because when i was in kaduna politics being played in kaduna was what it was entirely different from what i saw in Adamawa State. But one thing that has been, that was key, is your sincerity and entrustment. Once if you are sincere and you give the people the hope and you don't determine who becomes what, they give you that, they present you the person they want to vote into power. So when I was a chairman of APC Adamawa State, I never got myself entangled in all that were aspiring. And every time I... Nobody brought bags to you? Nobody. <laughs> I refuse it. And I stand to be corrected and challenged. I refuse it. 10 to 6 a.m. p.m. I'm in the office. We discuss whatever we want to discuss and we allow. But constantly and always is giving hope to the leadership from the word, to the unit, to the local government to say, hey, do we want to win election? If the answer is yes, then give us competent and capable people that the people will not say no to. And to, to, to the best, I wasn't thinking I was going to be part of those that will be elected. So we went now looking for who will now become a member, I mean a senator representing Adama North. Because Adama North at that point in time is a no-go area for any political party apart from PDP. So whoever you are now going to ask, uh, come and take a ticket, was not, no, APC is not going anywhere in Adamawa North. But until when the now people are saying, okay, but you too, we are once a member, and you have played a very vital role in that two local government. So selling you in three local government will not be a problem. So I came at the last resort, trying to fill in the gap. But again, like I said, people are watching you on all that you have done. What I did in Kaduna, I never knew it was going to have an impact in my, 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 in my, in, in Adama North, in my state. But what we're saying is that don't bring someone and enforce that person. Take a good example of what happened in Nasara State in this last election. A senator that was there, I think Kwashiki, Godia Kwashiki, came in under APC. The national chairman of APC then was, from, was a former senator, Abdullahi, who is from Nasara State. The former governor was a senator of Adama State. But Kwashiki and uh, Wadada were refused a ticket on the APC. They now went back to SZP, which nobody ever believed. But because of the impact they have placed or they have done in their constituency, the people refuse to vote for APC who has the national chairman and the party, I mean the government of the day, APC. They voted the two members, I mean as, as senators, representing two different, under another political party. So I said, the wish of the people now I, is becoming louder and their voice you cannot you cannot push aside. Mm. So what we are saying is that democracy will work when there is a platform that is not been I mean, uh, uh, meddled within to now say no. Uh, okay, Binta, it happens to me in 2019. It happens to me in 2019. You know, Binta is not coming and it stops there. You know, what did she do? And nothing, but she's not coming. You know, I like, I like this point that you've raised and I'm, I'm, I'm just going to allow uh, honorable, honorable to wear on it uh, because it's 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 what a lot of you know people have been you know also uh, thinking about uh, when you look at 25 years ago some people would say that you know in terms of economic indices mm -hmm. then the the value of the naira against you know the, the dollar. dollar 
you know, was much appreciable. Mm -hmm. and, and then, of course, uh, uh, the kind of malfeasance and you know, corruption we see today, you know, was not there 25 years ago. Probably uh, thinking that democracy enabled, you know, uh, these, uh, you know, vices even much more than um, we, it used to be. If you can respond to this in less than 60 seconds, I'm, I'm afraid. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I would just like to uh, re-emphasize what she said. And I'm happy that you as a party administrator, a mm. uh, House of Fresh member, a senator, that you saw that sometimes when you have worked and the people truly desire mm. to have you back, you see a group of people say that uh, leaders mm. or you know administrators in the party say you will not go back. So I'm happy you corroborated that. Mm. And it's important for us to address that because that's what is causing problem. And I'm going to say that, yes, you said Naira has lost value and all that. It's uh, an accumulation of, well, maybe some of the missteps that we had in trying to run the democratic system of government. And also the fact that uh, people have moved away from our values, the values with which we are known over the years, for which, with which we are respected as people. Values of honesty, hard work, sincerity of purpose, good neighborliness. Those things, they should not be washed away by democracy or military regime. Once we have those values and keep them, we continue to make gradual but steady you know, progress in what we are doing. Horrible, thank you very much for your interventions this morning, uh, as usual. And of course, uh, we continue to look at the, the democratic space and uh, contribute our quota. And we've had Honorable Sam Onuibo, former lawmaker, uh, representing Ekwano, Umaya North and South, uh, federal constituency of uh, Abia State on the program. And uh, of school, we've had uh, Senator Binta Masigarba, former member, House of Representative, former senator, and former uh, party chairman. <laughs> Uh, who contributed immensely uh, so far in this uh, Fourth Republic. And from Ibadan, from my alma mater, we've had uh, uh, Professor Emmanuel Emiaye, the Professor of uh, Political Institutions, Governance and Public Policy, Department of Political Science, University of Ibadan. UI is for you and I. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> All right, uh, we, did, we did say that uh, this, uh, this is a conversation that we cannot end in one edition of Good Morning Nigeria. 25 years of unbroken democracy is such a long time, and there's so many, uh, you know, f frames to, to talk about. And so we do appreciate all our guests. But you're watching Good Morning Nigeria. Please stay with us. When we come back, we commence our second topic on the organized labor strike. <laughs>